so hi all um thanks for coming to my talk the adventure hackers toolbox um i know there's shed loads of other awesome talks going on at the same time uh i've been frustrated that there's not three of me in order to be able to watch all of them at once uh so i really appreciate you uh spending some time and, and coming to watch this one so uh a little bit about me uh, i think someone was covering the intro uh, but my name's tom harrison uh, i've been in infosec for uh, way too long in this case over 15 years um I am uh, that garbled collection of uh, kind of letters and et cetera uh, is uh, my job title, which is Senior Subject Matter Expert for Advanced Intrusion Testing at Lloyd's Banking Group. Uh, so you can see why I uh, kind of use the term adventure hacker, uh, kind of differentiates from the in the bedroom, uh, you know, hacking remote sites uh, type of hacker uh, to actually doing things in person and doing physical intrusion, all that sort of stuff, good stuff. Uh, social engineering is, is one of my specialities, one of my domains. Uh, within my job. Um, I've got some of the standard disclaimers to do. So everything in this talk is me, uh, nothing to do with my employer. Uh, likewise, I'm not going to be able to discuss uh, specific tests or findings, etc. Uh, one of the curses of being part of an internal red team. Also, some of the stuff uh, we're going to talk about are uh, offensive techniques. Uh, you know, red team is all about looking at things through the eyes of the attacker. Uh, so, you know, do good with it, not evil. Um, only use the stuff we're discussing on things you've been approved to test on, uh, you know, approved targets, that sort of thing. Uh, I am a gamer, uh, so everything from really esoteric board games through to uh, LARPs, the picture on the right is, is one of the LARPs that I run, through to uh, video games and kind of everything in between. Um, then there's my primary objective, uh, so uh, I'm a dad, um, I've got two teenage kids and I've got another two uh, in the way, so uh, if I could have like, you know, Fs in chat for my uh, gradual loss of free time that's going to come on later this year. Um, and I'm a nerd on a whole bunch of different subjects. So psychology, language, systems, technology, any of that stuff uh, I've been digging into for way longer than I care to remember. Um, and you know, there's never enough time to learn all the things that you want to. So in terms of what we're talking about today, uh, we're gonna go down the rabbit hole a little bit, uh, explain what got me to this point of uh, looking into this stuff and uh, you know what it is we're talking about. We're gonna uh, introduce a rating system to kind of help rate these devices, the type of things we're talking about dropping in offices. Um, and then we'll delve into the toolbox. Uh, so mostly uh, some pretty simple stuff, um, then things that play with the way that humans interact with computers, then finally kind of implants and drop boxes and that sort of thing. And then uh, we'll go through the obligatory defender bit. So I always feel like at the end of uh, any kind of red team offensive style talk, having a bit uh, for the blue side to go, how, how does someone defend against this? You know, what can I do in order to stop it is really important. So down the rabbit hole, uh, what are we talking about? How did we end up here? Uh, so up until kind of four or five years ago, uh, I was very much this type of hacker. Uh, you know, I was working doing vulnerability analytics, proof of concepts, web app pen tests, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, sat in an office with uh, a computer, rarely interacting with other people, uh, you know, finding vulnerabilities and being happy about finding them. Um, due to an internal reshuffle and kind of creation of a new team, I was moved into uh, what we term as being uh, advanced intrusion testing or, or red teaming. Um, so obviously, from my point of view, uh, suddenly the three P's were in scope as well as technology. So I could focus on people, process and physical. So in the back of my head, there was this kind of voice going, you know, finally, I can stop being this nerd on the left and start being the really uh, adventurous, uh, charming guy that's on the right, uh, which I don't think ever truly happened, but um, at least I think I've got some elements of it. So following that, uh, I then delved into uh, kind of social engineering as well as uh, physical security stuff. So uh, lock picking, which I am passable at, uh, but not amazing enough to be able to actually use it on a job. Uh, physical intrusion and kind of lock bypass stuff, which is still uh, by far my favored method of uh, entering buildings, that sort of thing. If you can bypass locks, then you should never, never bother trying to pick them in the first place. Um, I spent an unholy large amount of time going into uh, RFID. Uh, it seems like it is a really key uh, security measure, physical security control uh, across a whole bunch of companies these days, uh, particularly the Proxmark 3 RDV4, which is what's in that picture there, a really small little device that's, that's well worth people's time if they can pick one up. Uh, but also a bunch of other devices uh, looking at RFID and, and kind of wireless frequencies, that sort of stuff. So coupled with that, uh, I was lucky enough to get to combine psychology, which is my uh, kind of long-term hobby and interest uh, with work in the form of social engineering. So I'd read books, I'd uh, look things up, I'd you know spent hours digesting pretty much anything I could get my hands on to do with SE before I entered a red team. Um, 
and uh, eventually managed to get to do uh, APSE uh, with the SEPP certificate and subsequently MLSE uh, with the MLSE certificate as well. Um, and then got the chance to be able to put this into active tests and call myself a professional social engineer, uh, which you know is, is kind of kind of a dream from my point of view. I know a lot of people sort of just accept it as being their job, but it's something that you know I'd always wanted to do. So um, I've done a few talks on uh, social engineering and psychology, stroke language stuff. Uh, that can all be found on YouTube if you dig around a little bit. Uh, but I figured actually for this audience, uh, probably not talking about the actual social engineering stuff and kind of focusing on some of the tech aspects of social engineering adventures and that sort of thing might be a little bit more uh, kind of interesting and something a little bit different from the other stuff that's there. So at this point, uh, I got to the stage where I felt like I had a whole bunch of tools and skills to get past both the physical and the people perimeter. Uh, so, you know, people holding doors open, badly fitted locks, cloned pass cards, all that sort of stuff. But I had the uh, feeling of, of then what? Like, you know, well, as a red teamer, you, it's very, very infrequent that your job is just to walk into the building and get a cup of coffee or, or you know, get into the building the first point. Um, you want to achieve some sort of um, some sort of objective, uh, you know, be that sensitive information, network access, uh, compromising domain controllers, that sort of thing. So let me on to what devices could I drop or place in order to compromise an organization and make my uh, office bound red team hackers and operators happy when they uh, remotely connect into it. So that brings us on to uh, sort of where we're at and what we're on, what's in scope and what's not. So uh, the devices of interest are going to require local physical access, uh, grant some sort of level of additional access or capability. This is the stuff that you know makes us excited, gives us uh, furthers our objectives. Uh, they can be installed quickly and covertly, and it's likely to evade uh, blue team and user detection. Uh, so stuff that's kind of out of scope, uh, predominantly because uh, I can't do these subjects uh, massive amount of ju justice in this speech, and I'm going to talk about everything else. So. Wi-Fi, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's out there in terms of, uh, you know, Wi-Fi pen testing, that sort of thing. Um, there's uh, physical access and, and people tool set. Other people have talked a lot. There's a load, been a load of really good talks on, uh, you know, using uh, trust and rapport in order to leverage uh, people to get them to do what you want, that sort of thing. Uh, so we're going to kind of assume access from the point of view of this presentation. Um, Cameras, microphones, and surveillance devices. So uh, probably something I could have given an entire different talk on, but one I've gradually realized over the last few years is that the more images and cameras and microphones and that sort of thing you manage to take in with you on a physical engagement, uh, the more useful information you get out, uh, particularly when you talk about the cycle of um, you know, recon and then repeating um, your initial stages uh, based on the stuff that you've learned. We're not going to do any remote attacks. Uh, they don't include any adventure. Uh, those are just standard hackers. And we're not going to go into massively deep technical detail. Uh, whilst these things you know, do warrant that kind of investigation in some cases, uh, it's not something that I figured that it would be sort of appropriate for this audience. So next, we're on to something that I hear uh, you know, quite a lot. And I wanted to have a quick word on kind of threat intelligence or threat modeling for this stuff. So people claim uh, that these type of attacks are, are Hollywood and not real life. You know, it only happens in Mission Impossible or James Bond or that sort of thing. Um, but there's three quick real world examples of where someone has, has dropped some sort of device and it's, it's led to compromise. So um, NASA getting hacked uh, about this time last year uh, due to an authorized use of a Raspberry Pi. Uh, this was they stole Mars mission data, which, you know, in terms of things that NASA keep uh, secret and safe, you'd expect to be right up there. Uh, then uh, probably my favorite one and one I've spent a bunch of time investigating, looking into an attack called Dark Vishnia, which happened in Eastern Europe uh, throughout 2017 and 2018. Uh, a bunch of malicious actors uh, dropped laptops, Raspberry Pis and Bash Bunnies uh, inside financial organizations and uh, affected at least eight banks and were said to have stolen tens of millions of dollars. And then uh, another one of another type of advice. Uh, a um, employee was uh, persuaded in order to plug in a keyboard video mouse switch, uh, which had subsequent access over a 4G network, and it led to over 1.25 million pounds of fraud. Uh, it's probably like 1.5 million in dollars. So yeah, so these things do happen. Uh, they are uh, actively pursued by uh, criminals in the wild, and they do lead to pretty substantial losses of, of money. So. Before I start going into the other stuff too detailed, uh, I wanted to say something um, uh, you know about uh, me and some of the stuff that I've, I've looked into. I'm not the creator or author of any of the hardware or software I'm about to show. Uh, there's a whole load of geniuses who've paved the way and my research and learning time is mostly about educating myself on others work and trying to tie it together and find practical uses and go right how would this fit in an operation that we're doing or how would this fit 
if we've got this type of access. Um, hopefully, uh, none of this stuff or following it or investigating it yourself will take massive amounts of coding or hardware work. I'm a passable coder uh, with, uh, whilst it being extremely messy with it, and I'm a barely capable hardware engineer. Like, uh, give me a soldering iron, and uh, after burning myself a few times, I might manage to get something attached, but I'm by no means kind of proficient in it. So, universal rating system, um, I wanted to uh, kind of give some sort of method for rating things that's nice and simple. Uh, so I followed the um, methodology from Robot Wars of giving them four main criteria. So our, our main criteria, uh, we've got ninjas uh, covering uh, covertness. Uh, so when this device is physically planted, how likely is someone that someone will find it and trash it? Uh, we've got our little hackers in the red team uh, to represent our operator joy. So how uh, happy will our uh, shell addicted remote operators be that we managed to get this piece of kit planted in our target network. Blue detectability, um, will our blue team be able to uh, you know, detect it on the network or potentially install stuff that prevents it? And then cost, uh, how much of your hard-earned currency we need to invest. Um, I'm also going to cover kind of uh, a more precise cost as well as the time to implant. So how long do you need to be in this awkward position uh, fiddling about with someone's computer or a network port or something similar um, before uh, it's installed and you can walk away. So I also need to mention a couple of uh, issues that lockdown has caused me uh, following sort of the COVID-19 stuff over the last few months. Uh, my office and lab access have been pretty limit limited, uh, so there's not a whole bunch of demos. Uh, it turns out I wouldn't have had space for them anyway once at the time of the talk. Um, and I'd plan to get a professional hand model and photo shoot for all the different devices, you know, splash some cash and uh, get something really presentable for everyone. Uh, but obviously lockdowns prevented that. So I've had to use uh, whatever resources I had available to me. Uh, I went around all my family asking them if they'd pose with different, uh, you know, hacking devices, that sort of thing. And unfortunately, the only one who said yes was the one who was willing to work for Biscuits, uh, which is, uh, so I'd like to introduce you to my dog, Lockie. Um, Hopefully, she's going to provide some respite from the uh, series of pictures of small electronic devices because uh, there might at least be some sort of fluffy animal in the background. So, going on to the toolbox itself. In order to kind of use it as an example and test the rating system, I decided to go for what was the first time where I plugged something into something else in order to do something vaguely malicious. Uh, so I went, started thinking back to the mid 90s and could remember playing around with a virus called Parity Boot B. It was the first um, virus that I ever really got involved with and, and, and you know, looked into in any depth. Uh, you could get it to infect floppy drives that you put into an affected machine and then subsequently go and plug those into other hard drives, that sort of thing, into other machines and compromise the hard drives. Um, no point did it give you any level access or do anything especially interesting uh, beyond a force occasional reboots. Then I talked to an old school friend who corrected me and said a year or two before that, uh, we'd spent the time creating uh, what's called a floppy disk bomb, uh, which involves using the phosphorus from match heads, uh, gluing them on the spinny bit on the inside of the disk and then waiting for it to set something on fire. So uh, to test our rating system, uh, you can see uh, both of them are giving uh, pretty minimal hacker joy. Uh, our operators aren't going to be especially impressed that we set fire to something or that we forced it to occasionally reboot. Um, Parity Boot B disk is a little bit more stealthy because it's not setting anything on fire, um, which is you know something that's quite uh, easily flaggable. Um, then uh, it's, but it's likely to be more easily detected uh, by our blue team. So uh, they will actually potentially, you know, uh, Oh, sorry, it's slightly less likely to get detected by a blue team because we'd hope that the blue team would detect stuff uh, that's being set on fire and might pick up something as old as 1992 from uh, a, a virus being affecting machine. So, onto the first one and probably the basic of most of all the devices we're going to be going through. USB boot sticks. So uh, they're, you know, they're super cheap and, uh, and stealthy, uh, just a regular USB stick. Uh, so hence why we're scoring uh, four ninjas out of five. Um, usage uh, is the only bit of it that's not so stealthy, uh, preventing them getting the five star rating. Um, you tend to have to sit and wait for a little while for whatever it is you're going to be doing and you're going to be restarting a machine. Um, it can get access to uh, local users' passwords and secrets from the host storage, can capture recent memory from the device, that sort of thing, and also potentially boot uh, a different OS for malicious use if you're going to be sat there for half an hour and you're pretty much guaranteeing that no one's going to sit there, no one's going to find you and wonder what it is you're doing. Um, take a minute plus to deploy. As I said, you've got to force a reboot on the machine, and they cost less than $5. 
So score really well on the uh, ninjas and the uh, uh, cost efficiency, uh, but not so great on the blue team detecting them. They might detect the type of stuff you're doing. Um, likewise, it might be BIOS protected or, or the hard drive might be encrypted. That'll prevent us doing what we want to do. And our home, our uh, hackers back in the office aren't going to be especially impressed. You'd have to do everything that you're going in there to do. So it requires kind of technical skills at the same time as those physical intrusion and social engineering skills. So onto um, kind of the human interface. So this is going to cover a whole bunch of different um, manipulating of the ways that human interact with their computers. Uh, so probably the the first one and the most uh, obvious and widespread of, of social engineering tools is probably keyloggers. So uh, I found out this is the oldest one of all the things that I've listed in this talk. Uh, they were used in the typewriters in, 19, in the 1970s by the Soviet Union. So before there were keyboards, there were key loggers. So um, I think they score uh, about a four out of um, five on terms of ninjas. Um, so they're pretty inconspicuous and tend to look like a dongle or a USB extension cable. Uh, I really like the one that's uh, pictured with Lockie on the left there because that lets you hide the bulky bit behind the back of a desk or or a little bit away from the back of a computer. People don't, people tend to look at the back of their computer to find things. They won't necessarily look at what the things at the back of their computer are connected to in order to find things. So um, they can be pre-installed into keyboards uh, as a free gift, which again helps with that, that Ninja rating. Um, it's a little bit of work to solder something in line to the USB cable of a, of a fancy keyboard and then send that to someone, to someone as a gift. Um, only gets two hackers. So uh, this is all about uh, exfiltrating information. Even the Wi-Fi based ones, you need to be relatively close in order to be able to get that information off. Um, it might be really useful if, if we find that the user has been logging into some sort of cloud based or external based services that you can then compromise and within scope. Uh, but it's definitely stuff that gives us a foothold rather than any type of achieving an objective. Uh, and then it's got four cops out of five. Um, so exceptionally difficult to pick up um, USB key loggers, um, especially if they're you know, acting totally transparently and presenting as the keyboard that's in the background. Uh, they're, they're you know, a really good tool. You, are, you won't expect to get the, uh, the blue team picking up um, you know, use of it. The only kind of prevention, uh, wireless keyboards or, or all-in-one machines, laptops, that sort of stuff, anyone when someone's not using the physical feed keyboard that this sort of stuff requires. So uh, moving on to uh, another device. So this is the first one of the series of devices that I'm going to talk about that are uh, a bad USB device. Uh, so this was something uh, that was kind of coined by Carsten Knoll and Jason Lau of Black Hat in 2014. Um, it's a tool that impersonates a keyboard. Uh, so it can be uh, plugged in and type a whole bunch of stuff that's been saved on the device uh, automatically without you needing to touch the keyboard, uh, impersonates one and types it all out. So uh, this can have issues. Uh, so sometimes when you've got uh, different language layouts for keyboards, uh, you've programmed something that you're expecting to be, uh, in my case, uh, uh, UK English, and then they've got their keyboard still set to the incredibly annoying default of US English, uh, means that they, it just won't run. They, they type the wrong characters out and you script or start to do hideous things. So it's pretty covert. The device you see there is is, is pretty tiny. Uh, it can be wrapped in a case to make it a little bit less suspicious than being a bit of um, circuit board. Um, in terms of our hacker buddies, uh, we can do stuff like um, dropping what's called a stager. So that's uh, something that then downloads the rest of our malicious payload from something on the, from somewhere on the internet. Uh, but running anything complex, like trying to type out a full uh, payload or, or anything like that, is probably going to be out due to the small amount of memory that's on the drive. Uh, the uh, likewise, uh, the blue team might detect us reaching out to the internet or uh, even in some cases detect strange user activity. So these things tend to try and type way faster than you'd expect a human to do and do things that it's unlikely that your average user that you've compromised would do. And then the other uh, method of detecting them is potentially via um, the vendor ID or product ID of the keyboard that people use. So uh, all USB devices present this when they connect um, and you can do some recon beforehand, work out what brand of keyboard they're using and, and then impersonate that vid and PID. Uh, but oftentimes you won't necessarily get that chance. So people will see some sort of different device has been um, you know, plugged into the machine. Uh, the cost is absolutely amazing for these. So uh, less than $2, uh, I managed to get a whole bunch of them uh, for off Amazon. Um, they're cheap enough to drop and forget. I've never actually had a test where 
the chance of someone taking it home and plugging it into their home machine uh, hasn't been considered more important than, than utilizing it. So uh, it's not something that we ever do is in terms of dropping and forgetting stuff. But, uh, you know, in theory, uh, you know, you can plug this in and walk away if you want to, if you need to suddenly leave the area that you're in. So on to probably the most famous of the bad USB devices, uh, the USB rubber ducky. Very, very similar to uh, the sort of um, methodology that the AT Tiny 85 and stuff uses. Um, acts as a keyboard. Uh, it's got some additional capabilities. It's capable of acting as a mass storage device. So uh, we can take out a whole bunch of files if we've got access to uh, mass storage devices on the machine. Uh, and it can, it's got a bigger payload space, so it can use SD cards. So then we can do that thing that I mentioned before of typing out a full payload. So fully compromising the machine start to finish rather than needing to call out to the internet in order to grab our malware and run it. Much easier just to have it all typed in, even if it takes a few seconds longer um, when you've got a machine in front of you that, that you, you can compromise with a USB stick. So uh, the fact that we can do that, gives it an extra cop. Uh, you know, it's now four out of five. Um, the cost is about $50. Again, not something that you um, ever want to kind of drop and forget uh, when I hear stories about people dropping hundreds of US, uh, USB rubber duckies uh, in car parks. I always kind of wish that I had someone who who was that lax about uh, sort of budgetary issues, but um, it's, it's not something that you'd ever expect to kind of drop everywhere and, and kind of wait for. So, Kind of evolution of that bad USB attack um, in terms of uh, covertness and stuff uh, is uh, the an OMG cable or USB Ninja. So this places the whole uh, computer on a chip uh, inside the uh, thick USB end of a charging cable. So you can see the USB Ninja there on the left and the um, OMG cable on the right. You can execute uh, payload, so you're able to execute payloads with keyboard and mouse action uh, as you could before. Uh, you can also um, delay the um, execution of your scripts so you can wait and trigger it via some sort of Wi-Fi command or something similar. So you can see this has got uh, five ninjas. Uh, it's super covert. Um, even once someone's um, you know, identified that something malicious is trying to do something on that computer, they might not even then question the really, really simple looking uh, charging cables that there's probably hundreds of in every office. Uh, the fact we can trigger it and access it via Wi-Fi gives us three hackers out of five. You know, it's, it's slightly more adaptable than the rubber ducky is or, or the Tiny 85. And again, four cops out of five. So it can be detected in similar ways to all the other bad USB devices. Uh, but again, you've got the added, added advantage of maybe they aren't going to question the uh, USB cable that someone's using for charging the phone. Um, cost is probably the downside of these. Uh, they're... Um, $55 uh, last time I checked for the USB Ninja and 110 for the OMG cable. Uh, the reason why they're both on one slide together is that they are very similar devices in terms of capability. I've been using the OMG cable for longer um, and uh, have played around with it a lot more, seems to have a much more active community or at least as far as I found. Um, so yeah, that's probably my, my favorite out of the two. So going on to one of my uh, more recent favorites in terms of bad USB devices and stuff, um, the WHID Elite. Uh, so not as stealthy as some of the others. Uh, it, it definitely uh, is a chunky USB stick if you're going to uh, put a case on it and plug it in. But it's got a bunch of bonus features that really kind of make up for that. So it's got a SIM card slot that lets us control and exfiltrate data, data pretty slowly over uh, the 2G uh, mobile network. I'm hoping for some sort of uh, 4G or 5G version soon because uh, that would make life a whole lot easier. And it's also got um, Audio surveillance, uh, it's got a microphone on there so it can pick up nearby audio and uh, record or transmit that to you. It's got GPS tracking, so uh, I've never found an actual use for it, uh, much as it's super interesting to be able to pull back the um, GPS information. Uh, and it's got an NRF chip, so uh, that could be used for some mouse jacking stuff. I'll, I'll talk about that in the next slide because we get go a bit deeper into that. Um, but it can be used to uh, gain access to people using wireless mouse, gain access to the host that's running that that particular wireless device. Uh, it's compatible with something called um, USA Bus E. Um, so this allows two-way comms through the keyboard driver. So you always think of the keyboard as being totally a one-way system that you you know use it to enter information into your computer. But it, in actual fact, that's a, a full kind of two-way comms between the keyboard and the computer. So by using the sort of keyboard driver, you can pop a shell on the target with the commands that you've stored and the scripts you've scored, and then uh, redirect that output uh, back over, usually a serial port, back to the uh, keyboard. So 
this means that we get a fully uh, interactive C2. So um, the fact we've not got, the uh, fact it's a little bit more obvious, gives us the three ninjas out of five. Uh, we get four hackers because our, our um, remote team are probably going to be much more happy that A, they can get access to stuff over 2G, and B, uh, you know, they can get a full uh, interactive shell through it. Uh, it's four cops out of five, because again, uh, it's just impersonating a keyboard. So as far as pretty much everything it does, unless you start looking into the really, really deep detail, uh, it's, it's just going to seem to be a keyboard to everyone who's looking. Um, cost about $40. Um, I've ordered myself a couple of the new versions recently. And yeah, for what it does and the amount of features it's got, uh, incredibly cheap, um, but not quite as cheap as some of the other stuff. So... Um, the Logitech unifying receiver. So this is something I've been playing with lately. I'm not intended to be a malicious tool at all. Um, it's designed, it's a tool, that, it's a uh, device that's designed to support multiple Logitech devices all connecting through one dongle. Uh, but you can also uh, fake being a Logitech device and kind of control and interact with it uh, through an NRF dongle, uh, like the one that's pictured there in, in the requires box. So uh, a bunch of very, very clever people, uh, Rogan Dawes, Marcus Mengs and others, um, did a piece of software called uh, Logitacker, which in theory allows potential hijacking of new existing, new and existing Logitech keyboards and mice. Uh, but I tend to use it uh, in this case as as a uh, way to pair with it prior to dropping it or placing it anywhere. Um, so it means that you can effectively act as the keyboard, but from anywhere within about I'd go to about 30 feet or so uh, before you start to lose signal. And again, it's compatible with that uh, USA bus E stuff. So it's um, really really um good for getting a kind of full c2 connection i think this is uh pretty damn stealthy so uh it looks like the type of dongle that everyone plugs into their machines even if you are looking for a malicious usb device a uh, dongle plugged in with logitech written on it is likely to be supporting someone's mouse or something like that so you're not really going to question it uh it's uh three hackers because it gives us that full c2 um Obviously, a little bit suspicious that it's going to be marked as a new keyboard or something similar to our blue guys. Uh, but then in terms of cost, uh, for both the dongles, they come in around $5 each. And the uh, NRF52840, uh, which is the one that's pictured there, is uh, somewhere around $10, $15 itself. Uh, I would always recommend getting the faster, newer Logitech unifying receivers. So uh, there's ones marked CU00012 rather than 7 uh, and flash them with the latest firmware. It just means that you can... Uh, enter text a lot faster. So if you are typing out full payloads, uh, you know, over the air, then you want to be able to do it as quickly as possible uh, without sort of interrupting uh, whichever user that you're, you're targeting. Cool. So the only uh, kind of screen monitoring tool that seems to be in uh, wide production um, that I've managed to find uh, is uh, the Hack5 Screen Crab. So uh, this streams uh, can stream regular interval screenshots via Wi-Fi access or record, record full captures to MP4 uh, on an in inbuilt storage. It it's requires additional power source. So uh, obviously, it can be via a USB. If you plug it into a host, you can uh, drag a USB cable, or you might get, get lucky and get a monitor that's got a powered USB port on it. Um, but otherwise, you're going to be plugging into uh, both your USB port, uh, the HDMI cable in both ends, and the monitor. So it's, it's a pretty extensive amount of time to set up. We're talking like 30 seconds plus, and it's also reasonably expensive at $150. Um, it's more chunky than a lot of devices we're talking about, so it only gets two ninjas. Uh, most of the time, uh, it's it's useful for things like identifying software use patterns or where someone has been putting in the information that you've grabbed from a keylogger or something like that. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's kind of better use in conjunction with other stuff. And it's got uh, five cops out of five. I, I've not seen anyone or anywhere that is detecting um, devices put in line to an HDMI cable. Um, it just doesn't seem to be something that's, that's done or there's not really a facility for it at the moment. Cool, so that kind of moves off the human interface stuff uh, and takes us on to uh, drop boxes. So drop boxes are a generic term uh, that I use for a malicious host that's planted in an organization. Uh, the concept's pretty simple. Uh, rather than compromising hosts within the organization, uh, we add another one uh, that's, that's under our complete control. Uh, that means we avoid antivirus agents, we avoid uh, endpoint detection response capability and all that good stuff um, because this isn't one of their boxes. 
Uh, it can also act as a uh, remote access device over the internet for the other devices we've gone through. Uh, so, you know, a lot of those have Wi-Fi access, and if you can't, aren't necessarily going to get within Wi-Fi range, being able to plant a Dropbox within Wi-Fi range and then use that to access them is often a good workaround. So stuff that you want to consider when we're talking Dropboxes, uh, what operating system you're going to put on it. So uh, versions of Linux, uh, there's good ARM versions of Kali and Parrot and a bunch of other uh, operating systems. Raspbian obviously is the primary use for Raspberry Pis and things, uh, but even uh, sort of open WRT, at which point it kind of acts as a uh, network access point or an access point for you onto the network rather than necessarily being the malicious host uh, and you just forward stuff through it. Uh, so hardware, Raspberry Pis, uh, Odroids are really good, uh, converted routers um, likewise I've used and, and I've had some success with. And then we're going to talk about how these things get internet access. So, uh, you know, we say we want to connect back to our command and control center. So uh, there's kind of three choices to make. Either if you're super lucky, you'll get a organization that's got a visitor or guest Wi-Fi. Uh, there's ways to uh, automate connecting to those um, if, if they've got some sort of splash page. Uh, if not, then uh, 4G and either a 4G dongle or, or hat for one of the devices or some sort of uh, 4G router planted nearby. Um, and then the other option, one that I don't tend to favor because it kind of uh, defies that point of trying to be as quiet and as subtle as possible is to tunnel back out through the organization's network and create a sort of separate covert channel uh, going through a web proxy or something similar. Um, for all of those, expect to use probably a couple of hundred megabytes per day if you're doing uh, actively, uh, you know, using it for reconnaissance and looking at the network and, and executing attacks. Uh, if you start to try and pull things back like, uh, you know, MP4s from the screen grab or, or screen grabs, that sort of thing, uh, then, you know, you probably start to go over that. But you shouldn't need a, a huge data plan in order to run uh, a SIM card or, or something similar on one of these devices. Then, uh, you know, covert container. So you can see there's one in the top right that's been built into a power brick. Uh, junction boxes are, are a really good choice. Uh, it's the one in the middle at the top. But stuff that doesn't make it look like a hideously malicious device is kind of really important, particularly if you're going to plant it somewhere where people might actually look. Uh, if you get the uh, joyous occasion of finding a roof tile where you can plant all this stuff in or a, um, you know, somewhere that's nicely out of the way that still has a network connection, uh, then you can start to be a little bit more free about what is contained in. But in general, you want to keep it uh, all wrapped up. Um, and then I always like stickers uh, on these. So People are put off by having a sticker saying, you know, don't handle this, it might set fire to you, or don't handle this, it's, it's got, you know, static sensitive, that sort of thing. Uh, warning stickers massively work in our advantage. And then the other option is obviously uh, how we're going to power it. So uh, whilst uh, plugging it into a host or into a USB adapter is good, uh, you can also use batteries. Uh, obviously, that's going to mean that it's going to run out at some point, so you need to kind of plan for that. So uh, our first uh, Dropbox. Uh, a net, just a standard network Dropbox. So this, in this case, is a Raspberry Pi 4. Um, it's kind of the traditional red team implant. Reasonably bulky compared to some of the others that you can get and some of the others I've seen. Um, but it's going to bring probably the most amount of hacker happiness that we've seen so far. So it's got four out of five. Um, because you walking into that building has effectively breached the hard outer shell of the organization for them. Uh, like you've gone past the difficult to bypass perimeter and got them into the uh, you know squishy, soft, juicy interior. So it only scores two cops uh, because there are ways to detect and prevent new hosts from connecting to network that are pretty common. And then you can also potentially pick up network activity coming out from the device. Uh, Raspberry Pi 4s at the moment are about $50. Uh, so it's scoring uh, three out of five on the, um, on the dollar coins. So PoE, drop, PoE network drop boxes, which is a slight variation on the previous one. Uh, but I included it due to it tending to be a smaller footprint and requiring a few less connections. It's the type of thing you can dump into places that happen to have network points but don't have necessarily a power point nearby. It just needs you to be able to plug into a power over ethernet powered um, network port. There's a couple of risks and limitations. So, excuse me. You might not have power over ethernet or enough power to power bigger boards with more accessories. So if you wanted to have a whole bunch of USB stuff plugged into it as well, uh, it might not be the best option. And it often requires a power over ethernet splitter um, in order to split it out so you can power both the device and still sort of pass through to whatever ethernet connection you're using. Um, otherwise, really similar to our other Dropbox, uh, you'll see the scores are all pretty much the same, uh, except for it's a little bit cheaper, so it scores a little bit higher on the coins at the bottom. So, uh, probably my favorite of all the devices that we've listed, um, something I spent a bunch of time looking into, 
uh, is uh, what I call a drop bridge. So this is a network drop box uh, that acts as a completely transparent network bridge as far as the network is concerned. So um, both the network and the host uh, basically think it's a piece of cable. Uh, so there's pretty much no, there's very, very few ways I should say of identifying the devices there. Uh, you can, uh, it was originally, uh, the original sort of theory on this was done by Alva Skip Duckwall, uh, um, Black Hat, or oh, sorry, DEF CON, I want to say 17, but I might be wrong with that. Uh, and then it's been improved on by uh, the NACAD and Skip scripts that I've included uh, links to down at the bottom. Um, it sits, uh, sits between the host and the network. So you unplug the host from the wall, plug it into this one, and then plug, this, uh, plug it into this device, and then plug this device back into the network again. Uh, it still operates if the host is uh, removed or switched off. So even if that host disappears, you've still got your malicious access. Uh, you can set it up with a bunch of kind of a subset of ports to use for its communication that our uh, host isn't going to use, or we don't think that the host is going to use. Uh, that means that we can do full network interactivity. So we can use it just like we would a network Dropbox, but the traffic is a lot scare, a lot um, more hidden. And likely if someone goes, uh, it's a malicious device, they'll be pointing at the host that you've connected to rather than your device being something to look into. It takes a little bit longer to deploy than a network Dropbox. Uh, we need to capture some data uh, see some packets flying along the wire in order to be able to know what it is we're impersonating both on the network side and on the host side. Uh, so you have to wait a little bit for it to do all that stuff. Um, but otherwise, it's um, you know pretty pretty ideal and very very difficult to pick up. Then uh, in terms of sort of pulling it all together, so uh, this is a shot of uh, five devices uh, in this case that gives us uh, full. Uh, remote external access, type of stuff that you can see fitting quite easily in a, in a handbag or some sort of, uh, you know, even pockets of a coat I've got that fit all this stuff in quite easily. Um, gives uh, full remote external access via uh, 4G. So, uh, you know, that's a 4G router in the back right there. Uh, just to make things easier. So I often find that being able to plant that somewhere else rather than having it necessarily attached to uh, your drop dot bridge or similar is going to mean that you get better uh, 4G reception. You can place it in somewhere that, that's right. And likewise, uh, you know, reducing the pants that everything's going to get swept up at the same time. Uh, you've got your keylogger to grab you those initial credentials, um, and as well as any sensitive information that the user's typing, which you can access through Wi-Fi. Uh, you've got an off-network C2 channel to the targeted host. Uh, so in the back of the um, NanoPi R1S, which is the version of the Raspberry Pi that I, that I use for a bunch of this stuff, uh, you can see there's a bunch of aerials sticking out. So as well as its own Wi-Fi, in there I've got an extra uh, Wi-Fi connection for if we want to reach out to connect to any of the devices that are on here. and an NRF dongle to be able to communicate across the uh, Logitech unifying receiver. Um, it can do obviously do the off-network screen captures via screen grab, uh, so you can capture those and then drag them back across 4G. Uh, and you can also do uh, covert network access, uh, obviously with a drop bridge and act as a host network tap. So you can see everything that that host that you're doing is, is uh, the host that you've compromised is doing through your drop bridge. Uh, it's a very strange kind of, um, issue with the drop bridge that you can't actually attack that host. Uh, it's, uh, you just can't send data that way down the wire, uh, but um, at least you can see all the data and potentially get secrets from that. So super quickly on to uh, Defender Advice. Uh, so kind of covered all the devices. So I wanted to say some stuff that will really help uh, the members of the blue team. I've tried to give some, uh, you know, pictorial examples of what I think the blue team probably look like, or at least uh, how they look like when I want to sort of terrify myself slightly. So, uh, you know, encrypt hard drives and set BIOS passwords. Uh, people should be doing this pretty much everywhere now. Um, you know, taking a hard, being able to boot something and read the hard drive uh, or, or, you know, boot something off a USB stick that you've got at all uh, is an issue. And those things don't cost a great deal. There's a whole bunch of great products out there that do it. Um, an allow list for USB devices. So obviously this is slightly uh, ideal world um, that you want to be able to know exactly what all of your organization are plugging in in terms of USB devices um, and then be able to set them on an allow list. So then if someone isn't impersonating the right keyboard or they try and plug something in that is um, obviously foreign and crazy, then they're going to, uh, you know, you're going to get alerts and it's going to get blocked. Uh, alert on hosts that change network speeds or do things that you can't imagine that hosts should regularly be doing. So um, some of these devices, uh, the NanoPi R1S, for example, um, 
might not support uh, full gigabit Ethernet. So the host might suddenly drop from gigabit down to 100 megabit. Now, your average user probably isn't going to notice that, but your uh, network and, and SOC admins, uh, you know, that's that's a pretty key indicator is that this thing has changed um, changed network speed with while still presenting as being the same device. Network access control, uh, network segregation, uh, you know, 802.1x is designed to uh, be able to uh, authenticate hosts that want network access. Uh, obviously, that trips up a lot of the Dropbox stuff. Um, they don't know how to what, what to present in order to be able to get onto the network. And also, uh, network segregation. Someone plugging something into an office shouldn't instantly be able to get access to your most important and most valuable servers. Uh, you know, make sure the stuff is separated so you can know that it's one part of the network that will get compromised, not the whole thing. It's important to uh, analyze data on the wire as well as uh, looking at endpoints. So a lot of this stuff tries to hide from people who are looking at the particular endpoints that are going around the network. But if an attacker is going to do something, yeah, you might not have picked up that they've got in there and planted a device, but you should be picking up when they're doing something uh, you know, on the wire, on the network, that sort of thing. Technical surveillance countermeasure checks. Uh, so that's a military term originally, but um, you know, checking actively uh, around buildings uh, regularly for this type of device or, or for devices that you think shouldn't be there, and you know, unplugging them, um, seeing who screams about it, uh, is, is quite a good option for making sure that this stuff isn't sat there for months and months uh, being you know, left alone and ignored. And then obviously the, the classic uh, for anything to do with social engineering, uh, but especially for this type of stuff, employee awareness, you know, if your employees recognize what their back of their computer should look like, they rec they'll recognize what the, their, um, you know, mouse and keyboard should look like, how things should behave. So your employee being aware that if that stuff starts to play up or something's weird to report it, um, you know, to flag it up. Also, you know, absolutely key. So that's the end of my talk. Thanks for listening. Uh, I'm always happy to chat about any of this stuff, take questions, uh, I believe I'm doing them in track three uh, since I can't hear the moderator. So if you've got any questions, fire them in there. Um, I'm uh, available on uh, Twitter, Gmail and the Many Hats Clubs, uh, pretext on all of those, uh, spelt with uh, tech in the middle. Um, also shout out to Hack Shacks for doing me the cool logo that you can see on the screen. Uh, so yeah, any questions? Cool. So I'm uh, MZO is talking about uh, having picked up the Hack Five Shark Jack recently. So I've got one of those on order. Uh, I'm waiting for it to arrive. Um, there's probably a whole bunch of different devices. So I saw someone mention the Plunderbug and all that sort of thing. Um, a whole bunch of devices that I kind of could have included in this uh, that you know follow that same sort of um, design and idea. But um, I think. So Shark Jack is probably a quick plug and remove device. Uh, it's the type of thing you'll drop and take with you uh, once it's done its purpose. Um, I can't see it being quite fully fledged enough to allow C2 or, or that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, certainly uh, an, a good part of the tool set, but something that I think you kind of have to expect to get detected um, based on some of the stuff that I've seen it running. Um, and then, you know, accept that it's going to get detected, but hopefully you're going to be long gone before the blue team manages to turn around and, and go someone plug something dodgy into that network port. So, um, so Whitney's asked, uh, generally walk in with a backpack or uh, other ways to hide tools while you're on site. So I try and avoid backpacks uh, at kind of all costs. Um, so uh, shoving them in, uh, you know, messenger bags or, uh, you know, obvious sort of side ba laptop bags tend to be a lot more uh, accepted. But I always try and when I'm sort of creating devices or looking at them, I also, I've always uh, tried to make them sort of as compact as possible so you can get them into pockets or uh you know suit pockets uh coat pockets that sort of thing um you know don't look like a guy who's carrying a load of tech into your base into the site basically um uh, for josh6543 um as i said i don't know how uh there's how people are going to start detecting hdmi inline devices uh or if they will or not like hdmi should in theory be able to provide the data to be able to dig into it 
Um, but uh, I can't think of anything software-wise that alerts on it or anything. Uh, D has asked, uh, what's an example of a drop bridge? Uh, because there's not, not nothing online that's got those. So yeah, it's a term I use for a Dropbox that has got two network ports and acts as a transparent bridge. Um, in my case, I use uh, a Raspberry Pi, oh, sorry, a uh, NanoPi R1S uh, for the stuff I've been doing, um, but it's just essentially a Raspberry Pi or something similar that's got uh, a couple of network ports that can act as a bridge. Um, and then, uh, Probably my final question I'll take, uh, Suture 7 uh, said you especially bypass NAC by impersonating a MAC address. Um, so you need to do more than just impersonate a MAC address uh, in order to bypass NAC. So it's important to both uh, impersonate the MAC address and also to uh, forward any frames, uh, forward any frames back to the, the host that you're compromising. So that's why the drop bridge is so good, because uh, as far as NAC's concerned, uh, it's sent, you can set a setting within Linux to say, uh, don't reply to uh, the AO 2.1x uh, packets, just forward them through to this other host. So the other host does all that hard work for you. You don't need to impersonate, um, you don't need to uh, sort of bypass NAC yourself because the host that you're doing is already authenticated. So all your traffic just looks like it comes from him. Great, thanks all for listening. Uh, I'll see you all soon.